All right, let's get started. So I want to say thank you to everyone for hopping on. My name is Jennifer. I'm from Sunstone Management. For those of you who aren't aware, Sunstone Management is a diversified private capital company located in Irvine, California. And we host events like these, fireside chats, panels, what have you, in order to better engage the local founder community. And today I have some amazing speakers. They will introduce themselves to you in just a little bit. And they'll go over today's topic, getting your startup from zero to one. Um, any sort of questions you have for them, go ahead and type it into the chat box and I'll go ahead and drop my contact info into the chat as well. Um, all right, take it away. Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rune Hauge. I am the co-founder and CEO of MentorCamp. We are a marketplace and a platform where founders and entrepreneurs like yourselves can get access to mentors with different types of uh, expertise that uh, is relevant to your startup. Uh, today, I have with me our very own head of operations and the former CEO and co-founder of Dog Walking and Pet Care Marketplace, WAG, Jason Meltzer. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for having me, for having me, Ruth. Wonderful to have you. So as Jennifer mentioned, we're going to talk about getting your startup from zero to one. Uh, we're going to touch upon a few different uh, topics in that regard. And Jason will also share from his own experience building WAG, which is now a publicly traded company on NASDAQ, uh, but building WAG from zero to one. So the early days of WAG and use some of his experience um, talking through some of that. Some of the challenges that startups typically have in that in that phase. So, I guess to to kick things off, uh, Jason, um, one of the things that I I hear a lot, uh, and I'm sure uh, the audience have heard too, is is this idea of having a solution looking for a problem. You don't want to be that type of founder, right? So. Can you maybe share some insights on identifying a problem that's actually worth solving? Yes, great question. And we probably all had great ideas, but you don't want to waste your precious time chasing ideas that aren't going to result in any big outcome. And, um, you know, one trick that I'm a big fan of is the mom test, for example. It's a great book that you can, you can get um, pretty much anywhere. And the concept here is that if you go to your mom with an idea, say, for an AI-generated recipe book, right, she's going to look at you and say, Rune, what a great idea. You're so brilliant. I'm sure it'll make a billion dollars. And so here you are thinking you've got this great idea. But the mom test will teach you that instead of going about it and sort of to your mom is going to do that because she loves you. Instead, you want to find the right questions first, try to understand her problems. A better approach would have been, hey, mom, you make us such great meals all the time. Where do you get your recipes from? And she might reply, well, I have a book from your grandma that she gave me and I follow that. Okay, but do you ever look for any new recipes that you can, you know, uh, when you're looking for new recipes, what do you do? She might tell you, you know, Rune, I never look for new recipes. I use this cookbook. It's been good enough for hundred years. So right then and there, you basically have from your mom, a more truthful statement that she would not purchase this AI recipe cookbook. And she may have just saved you years of your life from creating it. Um, I think that's a good story to highlight other things, which is um, trying to understand some sort of deep insight, uh, learning from previous careers, other product experiences you've had on ways to either improve them or finding some gaps in the market. Typically, that comes from some sort of deep insight that you have from uh, that you've unlocked yourself and, and you start trying to test that idea, uh, you want to look for hidden forces. Uh, I'm a big fan, uh, if you haven't tried this, of doing force mapping, where you basically you put everything on a board that could have relevancy to your product or your idea, uh, any sort of hidden force like inflation or AI or you know any topic. And then you start to think, well, how important will this be to my business three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? And you start to unlock what's the, you know, what's going to impact this idea to make it worth, worthwhile? Is it something that's great today, but going to be worthless 10 years from now? 
may not be a great place to start. And then finally, just make sure, you know, you have found your market fit. Are you the right person to solve this problem? Are you going to dedicate 10 years of your life? And if the answer is yes, the next thing you really want to do is get to work and put out an MVP and put up a waiting list. And if you get zero signups to your waiting list after, you know, two weeks or 30 days, and you've done a decent job of spreading the word to family, friends, or social media, then again, you might want to reconsider your idea or at least reposition how you're phrasing it. Yeah. So, so having, knowing that there's actually a problem there to solve is, is, is where you want to start. Right. And then what I also um, heard you saying is that having some kind of relationship to the problem really helps too. Right. Having that good founder market fit. How, how was that at, at WAG? Did you have any experience at all with dogs or pets when, when you first started WAG? Yes, that's a great question. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I was walking dogs when I was like 12 years old after school for money and then graduated uh, college and I met Tim Ferriss's for our work week, really inspired me to start my first dog walking company called Surf Dog LA, based here in Santa Monica, Venice area. And um, didn't follow the mom test there. Actually, my family thought I was crazy for starting a dog walking company. Then in one year, I was already, I was hiring a lot of their friends who were out of work, had a huge brand recognition in the side of town. And it eventually caught the attention of my partners at WAG. And we launched this product. And I knew Right? The hidden forest that I understood and the big insight I had was people are adopting dogs like crazy. People are working like harder than ever. Uh, the, 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 the demand for pet care needs is there's more demand than there is supply at the moment. Products like Uber and Airbnb were completely rewriting the game and making it so you could scale something globally. And the, and the demand for pet care was that high that I knew day one that I sort of got involved with WAG as their CEO, that this would one day be a billion dollar company. And we're, you know, we've kind of proven that. Mm. So you had, you, you already knew the problem firsthand. Yes. And uh, I think that's, that, that's really key very often. So I, I guess when, when you have this problem, right, and you're, you have an idea of how to solve it, I think the next step very often is, all right, I got to create this business plan. <laughs> Uh, in your opinion, what, what are the key components of a solid business plan that uh, that, that first-time founders or, or early-stage founders should focus on? Yes, great question. I, I get this question a lot. I've seen some founders who put in so much work and so much effort in developing these gorgeous business plans that just end up in the garbage. I'd much rather you build a pitch deck, right? And getting your thoughts and ideas down on paper just the basics, right? Like the problem you're you're facing, the solution, sort of defining like who is this customer that you're approaching, that who's gonna be buying your product? What are they expecting to get from this product, right? Why do they need it? Why does the world need you, need this product that you're gonna create into this world, right? How are people going to engage in it? How is it going to work? These are all things that you can put into a pitch deck. And once you have that business plan pitch deck, you can use that to start onboarding your teammates, right? Selling a big vision, selling the dream to people who, if you're a middle business mind and you need an engineer, you reach out to engineers, you go, hey, um, I've got this great idea and no one's going to want to read a business plan. But if you can present a compelling story with a pitch deck, that person is going to leave that meeting being like, wow, how can I miss out on the next big thing? That's how you're going to start to attract people to you. It's how you're going to get investors interested in you. And now you have written down on paper sort of your initial thesis of what you thought the problem was, your solution, how you're going to monetize the business, who is your target customer. And, and that's a great place to start once you have that idea that we've already battle tested. Yeah, absolutely. And you've done step one in, in sort of preparing something to put in front of investors eventually as well, right? You yes. build that pitch deck sort of as a, a, a recipe to follow for yourselves to start. And then you, you build on that um, as you go. Another good reason that I like using this pitch deck method is if you've ever seen a really well constructed business plan, it's almost like cemented in stone. And I've seen them, people hand them to me and, and, um, laminated folders, and I'm like, well, what happens if something changes? Right. <laughs> you, 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 you have no, you left yourself no room for any insights and changes and iteration. So by putting it on just a simple, you know, Google um, slides, 
you can play with the the branding you can play with your concept you can you know iterate as as time goes by as you learn and you want to use that time in front of potential employees potential founders potential investors to really battle test this initial business plan and find what questions they're asking mm -hmm. and then address those questions in the deck because the sooner you get through that deck, the faster you're going to start getting to the real questions, which is going to unlock if they want to work for you or if they want to fund right. you. Right. And th this is before you even start building. Even before you start building. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then when, when you do start building, right, you, you eventually you need a team. Yes. Uh, to typically, you need more than just the founders to sort of get beyond that initial traction. So... Um, maybe you can provide a little bit of guidance on, on how to assemble an effective team from the get-go because you're, you're, you're not going to go out there like you're, you know, Google or Uber or, you know, one of these big brand name companies in the beginning. You're not even going to be a hot startup, right? right. So, so, so how, do you, how do you assemble an effective team when, when you start out? Right. And this is, you know, a great question. And now, you know, again, just to get recap, right, we, now we have a great idea. We've got a business plan pitch deck that we can share. What you need to be doing to, to bring your vision to life is you're not going to be able to do it on your own. And I think what's driving you is some sort of passion that is pushing you towards bringing this product to market. And so you need to find a way to share that passion with other people. And so I recommend that you treat any potential employee or founder as if they were an investor themselves because they're investing something more precious than money. And that's their time. Right. And their lives and your potentially 10 years of their life will be spent with you in a room <laughs> in hard moments. So uh, passion, number one, if they don't have the passion for what you're solving. I, there's just no reason to continue the conversation. You want to evaluate their performance. Right. And you can do that with a skill test. You can ask to review some of their work, like even simple things. Like sometimes when I'm hiring someone, I'll like, what are you, I'll ask someone like, what are you passionate about? And I had someone who uh, we were hiring for someone to work customer service. And she said, well, I write these beautiful poems actually. And she's like, that's why not relevant. I'm like, it's absolutely relevant. Tomorrow, I want you to send me an email with a poem that you're going to write tonight. And then she did, right? And it's the fact that she took that action and the poem was good enough, it was good enough for me, right? But the fact that she followed up, she, she got things done, right? So that's passion, that's performance. Right. And then obviously you need persistence because doing a startup is no easy feat. There's no shortcut. There's no overnight successes, no matter what the media is telling you. It's usually like five years of hard work and, and some up and down. So you have to have someone who's going to be with you through the good times and the bad. And, and that persistence is what's going to push you through when you have strong conviction that what you're building is important. So those three P's are really what I look for. Um, and then lastly, what's really important in building a team is transparency, right? You really need to make sure that whoever's involved in the team from top to bottom knows what your mission is, knows what your goals are, um, knows the good and the bad, right? They should be facing these challenges together. That's what a startup is. It's a collective mind trying to bring something to this world that's not currently existing, right? Mm -hmm. So um Transparency is really important to keep the team happy and healthy and, and scaling and create great culture as well. How do you make yourself attractive to, to potential candidates? Um, well, I mean, I think, again, I think it goes to being transparent and selling that big vision, making sure that whatever um, the person who's, who's attempting to get this role understands exactly what criteria you're looking from this person, getting them to buy into that, that they can hit these goals, right? And, and I think, again, I mean, we really, this is your baby, right? So you're just going to be, uh, you're, you're always going to talk up your baby. And I really encourage founders, especially like the CEO and founder, to be present for onboarding their first 100 employees, right? Because that's how you pass that passion torch on. That's how you make sure that you're establishing a relationship of trust and transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, just don't be afraid to, um, you know, be involved in the hiring of your first 100 employees. So who are they, the first 100? Then you, then you already have a somewhat <laughs> decent sized organization, but maybe for the first 10, what, what were the key roles that you were looking for at WAG? What yeah. was really important? Great question. I mean, what we found uh, at WAG is like sort of the key for us 
was having a sort of like a project manager, right? And sometimes I have a CEO or a co-founder. You needed a designer, a great designer who is, you know, bought in and, and dedicated to unlocking and creating a great UI experience. And um, a developer, for us, it was developing a mobile app, so having a code. And I mean, that was really crucial. You need to have a great counterbalance of your initial resources early days because you're going to be forced to do a lot of things yourself. And ideally, you don't want too much overlap of the skill set. So mm -hmm. find complementary skill set people to come in. Um, some places you can go, obviously, is, you know, there's like the passive where you can put up a job board and hope people come to you. But you can also be very active. For instance, I was brought in to be the CEO of WAG because I already had a very well-established reputation with a dog walking company in LA. And they reached out to me saying, hey, we've got this idea. We think it could be big. We want to share it with you, right? And then after I reviewed it, I was like, this is a, this, this does have the, the, the stuff to go big, you know? So don't be shy to just find someone else in your space or maybe a, a competitor that had failed with their CEO that has all these insights that didn't get it right that time, but maybe can get it right this time with you, you know, to par partner up with you. Um, so you just, you can't be passive as a founder um, in the early days. You really just have to be active, have to go out there and get it and find the right people and make sure that they, um, that they're in it for the right reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in it for the right reasons. That's uh, really, really critical. And maybe also sometimes hard to detect, but worth doing the, the dirty work and rolling up your sleeves to, yes. to find, I think, as, as a founder. Of a startup. So, how do you? Let's talk a little bit about product development and, and iterating to to getting to to that, that that highly coveted product market fit, right? How, how do you approach product development and and, and iteration, uh, especially early on, to ensure that you're meeting market demands effectively? Yeah, that's another really great question, and I like to say like, don't be afraid to be stupid with your product, but also keep it simple. Right, you wanted something, um, whether it's a prototype or um, you know your your early MVP. You got to get something to market, and you want to keep it simple. It should solve one problem, right? One of my favorite products to this day still is Calendly, because it solves one problem for me really, really effectively. Which is, I'm not great at. I, I live and die by my calendar, but I don't love putting things on my calendar. I need them to do that for me and check my schedule for me. And that it does that to, as the best product I've ever used for solve that problem. So try to keep it simple, but don't be afraid to be dumb and put stuff out there that's not finished, that's not clean, that's a little dirty, that you might even know has some you know, holes in it. This is an iterative process. And the faster you get something out there, the faster you get insights back, um, which brings me to my next important point, which is you need a way to track um, your user experience, your user engagement with that initial product so you can optimize it. Uh, it's easier when you're doing software startups, right? Because you can put, there's companies like Heap, for example, which I'm a big fan of that track all of your user engagement and their experience. You can capture things like net promoter score as well, which tells you how likely the people who are using your product would like sort of recommend it to a friend or how, how great the experience has been on it or how poorly it is. Uh, these are things that you need to you need to track those early conversions very, very clearly. And most importantly, pay very close attention to your whales. Anybody who buys your product more than once, you want to get that person on the phone. You want to take them out to dinner. You want those whales to be your best friends because you want to build your product for the whales, mm -hmm. right? That's sort of a big secret to um, product development, iteration, and growth. They, they all connect. And so identify those whales, find out what they like best about the product, what they like least, and um, see what you're capable of, of iterating on the next step. Right, so this is really spending a ton of time with these, these whales is critical and understanding what their problems are and how you're actually going to solve it. You're not going to find out just by guessing, right? Right, you're you want to avoid. It's great to guess, I think, when you are building your initial like your initial product launch, like you're not going to have the information no. that you need or want, right? So you have to kind of take a guess and then you want to start making more educated guesses as 
the product comes further along. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of follow-up questions on that. So, we'll, a or one, what was that? What was that first initial product for Wag? And and, and two, who who were the who were the Wag whales? <laughs> Great question. So it's funny. The initial product for Wag, um, it had a bit more uh, search, and it had a bit more like. You can look at videos of the dog walkers, and we thought that that expertise was really, really important to drive conversions, which for us was like a paid dog walk, right? Um, but then as we started building our brand, we discovered that if we had a trusted brand, people would trust the product, and they didn't have to trust the actual dog walker as much as they did the product. Mm -hmm. So we sell, you know, we, we sold a lot about our insurance policies that we have, our screening processes that we put in place. We invested a lot in customer service to make sure people had a great experience. Uh, but I'll tell you, behind the scenes, we had a, we used to call it the horn. So literally, I had to work seven days a week, like 15 hour days for the first year at WAG, because when I wasn't working with team on product or marketing or, you know, just homework for the business, someone had to be on the customer service line 24 seven. And we had the most rudimentary product possible that was, you know, but it was all our lifeblood. Like we knew that customer service was what we were going to live or die by. Right. And so literally I, my daughter was born in that first year at WAG. She's now eight. And I, in the in the hospital, I'm literally doing customer service emails and manually booking a dog walks for dog walkers while my kid was just born. Right, so um, that's a little extreme, but you like find the most important touch point with your customer and do everything you can to make that experience delightful across the board. Yeah, someone's always there. Someone's there. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I think also one thing about WAG for those who who know the WAG story a little bit, WAG grew tremendously fast, uh, and acquired a lot of new users very very quickly. Got a lot of attention. Uh, so so obviously customer acquisition and marketing is really really important for 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 a startup. So can you maybe share some of the strategies that you used that were the most effective in acquiring and also retaining customers Yes, in those early days? Yeah, I mean, we really, I mean, the early days, fortunately for us, like I had my own dog walking company prior. And what I found useful were two main ingredients at that time. Like our business is hyper-local. So you have to know like how your business offering, is it geographic centric? Is it um gender centric or whatever, right? Who was the key user of this product? For us, it was local. So we had a lot of success with running local Facebook ads at that time. Um, and that really got us our first like thousand customers. And one thing that I learned in my small business was just walking up to people with a business card, guerrilla tactics, going to a dog park, going, walking down Venice Boulevard, seeing somebody with a dog and handing out cards. So from day one, I mean, we had, what we did is I had us buy a life-size dog suit and we would go to Runyon Canyon with the person in a dog suit and like a table and just collect people's emails and say, hey, we're going to be launching a dog walking company soon. It's going to work a lot like Uber, but for hiring dog walkers, if I can get your email, we'll let you know when it's public. And we probably collected over 500 emails like that in our first month uh and those converted and that's why when we launched the product we launched like january 1st of 2015 we had customers on day one sign up and pay for dog walking and so you know so those are the early channels a lot of facebook local search ads uh guerrilla tactics then as we developed further i mean we tested everything i mean you obviously need a good i mean email drip campaigns or help push people through the funnel uh, make sure you don't have a leaky bucket, which is if people come to your product or your site and they don't convert, find out why they're not converting. Maybe there's a glitch in the product or so the way you're communicating your product isn't dialed in properly. Um, but we did really test everything from, at one minute, <laughs> we were like trying to growth hack Reddit and mm -hmm. and getting like all of our reviews. We captured reviews in the app and we were like republishing them to Reddit with a link back to the app. And 
it worked in that one day. Like we had like, we sort of, we sort of like broke Reddit that day. Um, but again, those are a bit later stage, but in the early stage, like start simple. Start with one channel that you believe is going to work, whether that's search ads or SEO, content, Facebook, TikTok, whatever it is, pick your one channel, track if it's working, where the drop-off is, funnel analytics, funnel conversion metrics. If you can move that conversion at all, based on just changing your tone of voice or changing your product or, or anything in the ads, like that's a good sign that you could start looking for other channels to do the same thing. So, um, you know, there's no magic answer here. Everyone's gonna have, we all have the same opportunities for different marketing channels and you're gonna find the one that works best for you by experimenting with them all, but don't spread your resources too thin because you need to have the amount of budget to make these channels work as well. That's a good point. How how, uh, how many channels should you test at once? I mean, like I said, I think it's really important you have like one channel first, get a baseline for that, see if you can shift the conversion on that a significant percentage by adjusting something in your marketing copy. That's kind of your first insight and in what's working on your funnel. Now at least you feel more comfortable testing another channel because you're like, oh, I like, I unlocked my first insight. I know that this copy actually performs better than this copy or this color works better than that color. This value prop sells better than this value prop. So now you have um, a baseline, a cohort that you know is the control group and you can test it against another channel. But in the early days, I would really encourage you not to do more than two at a time. Mm. Um, until you really understand what's driving it, because this is all about zero to one, right? If you're trying to get investment nowadays, like the investors are expecting businesses that generate revenue. And so just having a tap into a tiny um, pool of new customers, you wanna start measuring retention on those users, right? That's another really important metric that you wanna track. Um, lifetime value, how long they stick with the business. And then once you understand what you're spending to acquire a user and how much money they spend on the platform, now you're ready to really start testing more channels and scaling it and getting ready for growth. So once you've found out the, cha the channels or the channel that's really working and, and you start scaling it, that sort of comes with its own set of challenges, yes. right? So, so how, do you, how do you manage those? Uh, those challenges and, and set yourself up for, for rapid growth? Uh, <laughs> when you get ready for rapid growth, get ready for the house to start burning. <laughs> this is right. really the answer, right? Because every system that you have is going to get tested. Your customer service line, you bet, oh, customer service is easy. Yeah, until you unlock your, your growth channel and start funneling resources to optimize it. And then all of a sudden you have 10,000 people trying to reach you and complain about a, a button that's not working. Uh, all of the problems that you didn't know were there will emerge all at once and it will feel like your house is on fire. And so what you need to do in those times is be transparent, bring the team together, say, guys, good news is we've unlocked a growth channel that's working for us. And uh, this is really powerful. Bad news is we have a lot of things we got to get fixed right now. Let's create priorities. Let's create assignments and tackle these one by one. And the trick is you have to accept that some parts of the house are going to remain on fire, <laughs> right? Just make sure it's none of the crucial parts. Yeah. And usually the way to identify the crucial from the non-crucial, anything that really touches a customer, crucial. Anything that is just like, oh, crap, we're now responsible for, you know, back-end stuff, uh, let that burn and and put people on it as yeah. best you can yeah i think that's 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 a good way of uh of thinking about the priorities right is it touching the customer or is it not right right and you always want to be there for the customer um especially during, during those early days and when you when you scale good problem to have though that's 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 the typical product market fit aha now we got it right right like oh shit, the house is burning down everything's breaking we used to call that at WAG when we'd be like, okay, are we dancing on the tables tonight? Mm. Right. When we knew we got something that um, hit its mark and, and we knew we had a product manager runs into your office and says, oh no, like we're, 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 we're losing people here. We're getting bad reports right now. Like 
deep down, you actually know that's a good thing. If people are complaining, it's a sign that people want your product to work <laughs> and they're willing to take their time to actually complain about it. Yeah. So uh, customer service lines for any CEO founder out there, those should be, you should be plugged into those on what's happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you, you'll always face some obstacles as a startup, right? That's that's inevitable. It's always going to be there. So you might as well just anticipate these things. Yes. Uh, and there will be failures as well. Um, and, and I'm curious, how, how are you personally navigated these uh th these obstacles and, and and failures these challenges and and what, what lessons did you learn along the way yeah i mean you're definitely you're gonna face challenges i mean that is just your main job as a founder if you're on this call or any role you're in is like to find challenges face them head on and but again prioritize only focus on the challenges that really really matter um you have to get to the root issue of whatever this challenge is right if you're not able to raise money for your startup and you're running out of runway like what is the root problem is it talk to the investors that you already have talk to the ones that you've approached right find out what is the kpi what is the metric that matters most try to narrow it down to one root cause and do everything you can to solve that one root cause so if an investor says listen it's great that you're getting a thousand dollars in revenue, but we notice that your growth is less than 10% a month. You want to quantify, hey, like, what's more important to you, that my revenue stream grows or that our, we can show that users are really in demand of this product, mm. right? Quantify the root problem that's halting you from reaching your goals, and that, and that puts that person on the spot. Well, for us, like, we know that the money's there, so I really want to see your growth metrics at 20%. Okay, great. Like, what you're immediately going to start doing is calling your marketing team or yourself, you are the marketing team, get yourself in a room, review all of your ads, see if there's ways to optimize them, what channels might make sense, review your competitors, which channels are they using, and do whatever you can, discount your product if necessary, right? Get that metric to 20% a month, and then go back to that investor or whoever, you know, that's just an example of how you just focus on the root cause and do anything possible to solve that root cause. Um, and just again, I mean, you know, fail, if you're not failing in this business, then you're just not, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's, that's, that's very, very true. There's inevitable and or the failure is inevitable as a startup founder and and, 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 and the startup world, you, you're inevitably going to fail a lot of things you try. So I think just having thick skin and, and sort of being able to, withstand and also just expect those failures will will help right yeah. because it's also how you learn by failing and then trying again a little differently this time and that's how you eventually make progress at least that's been my experience very often i've learned more from some of my failures than <laughs> some of my successes by by a decent margin and, and this is again sort of to bring it back to our initial question about like persistence you know like you just have to have the persistence to keep wanting to unlock the next mystery that we're solved that you're solving and that's and that's why i love being an entrepreneur like that's why i wanted to come work as head of operations here at metrocam i feel like every day i'm solving a mystery and it makes what i do really really exciting all the time yeah yeah absolutely it's, it certainly is a lot of solving a mystery <laughs> falling around in the dark isn't yes. it um but uh, in in that uh, you know in, in that process, right? In in this like crazy startup world and this crazy life as an entrepreneur, um, you have to maintain some work life balance too, right? It's it's important, otherwise you'll just go nuts. <laughs> um, and what what uh, I guess what are some strategies and some some things you have done to sort of balance your personal well being with? Um, with your work yeah I, and i've i've been there i've literally been up against the wall completely beaten to a pulp i think the only thing operating was just my like work-life brain and everything else was turned off uh this was in that like first year of wag when my kid was being born and i'm on customer service and you know part of that i look back on with pride but part of it knows that like had i just scaled it back 10 percent what what further successes would we may have had if I not just been you know, so bloodied by the business? 
And I learned recently that Bob Iger, when he was the pre- last time he was president of Disney, he, he would make sure that he was home to have dinner with his daughter every single night. Mm. And I thought, wow, like if the president and CEO of Disney can manage to be home for dinner, I, I can manage to be home for dinner for my daughter, which I do now as well, right? Um, he would wake up earlier, get some exercise done, then get work, you know? We're so fortunate that we live in these times now where we have Zoom and a lot of us can do some remote working or working from home, you know, that you can get things, you can wake up and check the important stuff, put out the hot fires and then go to breakfast with your kid or, you know, I think it's just important that you find that meaning in your life that is causing you to invest all this time and energy into your startup, into your business. And it can't just be for the sake of the business alone. That meaning is going to really help you thrive in your business. I know that when my daughter was, I found out my daughter was being, I would, I can honestly tell you that I don't think WAG would be here today had it not been that I discovered that my daughter was to be born. Mm-hmm. Because at that time, I was very happy with my lifestyle business of Surf Dog LA, my dog walking company. Like I was living the life. I was, you know, in Venice Beach and having a good time and being with dogs and celebrity clients. Then I find out we're pregnant. And like my lifestyle is about to change. It was the biggest motivator for me to then look at, well, how do I scale this? How do I 100X this? I wanted to have the biggest dog walking company in the world then. Because I wanted, I knew my lifestyle was changing and I was preparing for that. So that was my meaning, you know? Um, so, so that's like, everyone has to find their own like personal meaning for them outside the business and then just make time for it. It's not too hard. I mean, I'm addicted to my calendar. If it's like not on my calendar, it's not going to get done. Uh, so make sure it's on my calendar. But um, set aside, you know, Start, if you're really in crunch mode, one hour a week to just do something you love, whether it's video games or fishing or driving your car, set aside at least one hour a week. And, and if things are a little less crunched, like maybe you can get, you know, half hour a day, like just keep in touch with what it is that makes you human and don't let the business dominate your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'll help you too. Right. 100%. Just getting, getting your mind off of the business and finding purpose in other things, I think will ultimately also help you think more clearly about your business. Yes. Right. Makes you more emotionally sort of available, which connects you with your customers maybe. Um, and like I said, I mean, I'm just a big fan of your calendar. Like just everything's in my calendar. So now I have daughter dinner at seven o'clock in my calendar every day. I'm going to make sure I'm there for it. Exactly. Uh, I think that was really, really good, Jason. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I do know we have a little bit of time left. So I uh, wanted to see if there are any questions from the audience uh, for Jason, anything that you want to ask about getting your startup from, from zero to one. Now's the time to ask. Uh, so let, let's see. I think we have a few questions already in the Q&A. If you can drop any questions in the Q&A, we'll, we'll call you out and we'll have you ask them. Um, so let's see here. This is cool. This is my, my favorite part, I think. Yeah, exactly. We have a, a couple there in the Q&A. So let's see. Do I actually no, we have our, our moderator here, uh, Jake. Yeah. Can you close it up? Hi, Julia. Um, I'm going to let you, um, uh, I'm going to let you ask your, your question live. So you're allowed to talk. So you want to call on someone? So if you call the person up and ask the question in the Q&A. Well, Hello? I'm live. Hey, yeah. Julia. Hi. That was such a great session. I am so inspired. I loved uh, the piece on your localized go-to-market strategy because that's something that I'm focused on. The dog suit. I was like, yes. Um, I, I'm just looking at your LinkedIn and I was wondering what you're up to now. I know you joined another startup here, but do you also mentor founders in the Sunstone portfolio or anything like that? Um, yeah, and uh, thanks for joining and I appreciate your, your kind comments. I'm now working full time with Rune and Jake on building out MentorCam. And it, it serves a great purpose for me. I've had the passion because I struggled to find mentors myself. 
and I really tried hard. I was surrounded by a lot of talented people, and but I wasn't really able to establish that mentorship relationship that I was looking for. Um, I think it can be a hopefully I, I could have avoided some mistakes had I had great mentorship. So um, I, I'm head of operations here, and I'm real excited to be on the team. And um, you know, I'm trying to change the world as best I can. Again, I think mentorship's a key part of that. I think, Julia, you had a, a follow-up question there, too. Are you mentoring anyone right now? Oh, <laughs> yes, great question. I do have a profile. Uh, you can book me on MentorCam for sessions. Uh, pretty limited. I think I only do like one hour um, a week or something like that. I do advise some startups. Obviously, I'm still very, very bullish on the pet care space. So I um, I love working with founders, advising them how to grow those businesses. And I just, I really love the early stage part of a uh, startup. It's just, it's fast paced and you, know, you make decisions that matter every day and uh, the accountability is there. So when you strike gold, you know, you, you earned it. Okay, perfect. So I'll help you dog food your own products. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Thank you. And, and uh, for, for everyone else, if you can uh, just state your name first, uh, because not everyone can see it, and then ask the question, that would be that would be fantastic. All right. So we got a bunch of questions coming in from Matt, so I'm going to let him start to talk. Um, and Matt, you can ask all these just directly to Runa and um, Jason. Uh, hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool. Hey, thanks for thanks for the, the the whole thing. It was awesome. Yes, I have a bunch of questions here, so I don't know if you can answer all of them because quite a lot. But um, let me just read that what they just wrote here. So, uh, yeah, I was just looking for like more ideas that you can share on uh, you know deeper meaning in doing business. So you touched on the topic. I I recently started thinking about it as well, especially you know um, just a random thing, but going through the burn and seeing like how you know other you know, communities are important and just deeper things in life on top of making money. I uh, also wanted to ask your opinion on like, you know, what, what does it make sense to go to other cities like San Francisco or anywhere particularly more entrepreneurial? I'm, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I see there as well. Um, I'm just curious what you think about, you know, the places. And then also we are building an entrepreneurial community as well. It works very different than your business. Uh, we're focused on digital B2B service providers, and we are at the kind of like a cult, um, cult start. So we're getting new users signing up every day, but they're not active. So we're you know trying to activate them somehow. So it's a lot of questions. I'm not sure like you know which of the questions you can answer, want to answer, but that's what I dropped in the Q and A. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I'll do my best. Maybe Ruth can keep me on track here, but. Um... First thing that stuck out to me is you mentioned that you're in Phoenix and you're wondering if it's worth relocating. I mean, I would say that wherever you live in the world now should not stop you from at least getting your startup from zero to one. And then if it's necessary to move to get from one to a million, then then consider it, right? But there's nothing that you can't do to like build up a wait list, like get your first customers through the door, understand what they like, you know, build out the business plan. Um, all those things I think you don't need to move for. And if you, and try and test them in your local market, I would say. Phoenix is certainly big enough. I went to ASU, so uh, go Sun Devils. Um, also, I know it's a, there's a lot of startup community there as well. I know ASU offers a lot of um, uh, resources, Right? I think Yelp has a big office there. So there is tech in Phoenix. I'll tap into that local community group you have there. Um, and let me uh, just to add a little bit to that. I, I, I agree with uh, Jason here that you know anything zero to one, you should be able to do in you know, whatever market you're in. The only thing I would would add is this, this little caveat here, you know, as a founder coming from, from Northern Norway, a very small town north of the Arctic Circle and, and now in LA by way of San Francisco, is that you, you're only gonna be as good as the people you surround yourself with, right? So if you're in a, uh, a geography, if you're in a region with a strong startup ecosystem, you're more likely to bump into more people that are really ambitious and good at what they do as far as building startups go. 
right? You're, you're going to have an easier time meeting more experienced founders for a coffee uh, or even investors now post COVID in a city like San Francisco or New York. Like other cities like LA, Miami also have tech ecosystems and startup ecosystems. And you're probably also going to find something in Phoenix. I'm not too familiar with, with that market, but uh, just make sure that you're in a place where you can surround yourself with really, really talented people that are also looking to build something, aspire to do something similar to what you aspire to do. Yeah, check out check out the resources at ASU. Um, I know they have a bunch for founders and entrepreneurship, and there's investors, investor clubs, tons of that stuff, VC clubs. Um, yeah, don't be afraid to, to join some of these clubs. What was another question that you, uh, I mean, or another question that just came in? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, thank thank you for the answer. Uh, it was very, very insightful. And also thanks for sharing your perspective on you know, Norway and San Francisco and all that. So um, yeah, the other, the other question was um, about this deeper meaning and doing business. I mean, like you, you said, you, you said you have a daughter, if I remember right. And that's why, you know, it kind of motivated you. I, I don't have, you know, I'm not in that position right now. And I don't think I will be anytime soon. But like, you know, I'm just curious, like, how do you find a deeper motivation? Um, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's 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 maybe an, like a meta question, like it's a bit abstract and maybe it's a different way for everyone. But yeah, it's, I'm very curious about it because it looks like you're on fire with your motivation. So, you know, <laughs> the energy is great. Thank you. Uh, well, that's the passion piece, right? Um, I mean, yes, you're right. It is very meta. It's going to be different for everyone. But what I think is important is like you try to find what you're passionate about outside of work and, and try to find the relation to what you're doing because then it makes what you're doing, even you're even more passionate about it, right? So it's, it's this balance. There's a tension between your meeting and your purpose and like what drives you and what you do for a living and what pays your bills and you want those to be as in sync as possible. And so you're right. I can't tell you what, you know, yours specifically is, but um, it sounds like you are starting a, a, a entrepreneurial sort of community. So clearly, like, you get energy from, like, networking with people, right? So maybe that's your deeper meaning right now, which is just, like, you like creating these connections for folks. And you get some sort of personal sort of um, endorphin from that. Uh, that could be a good enough meeting for now, right? It doesn't need to be a child. Find something simple at first and then and build on top of it. Yeah, and you're spot on. I mean, um, I just get so, like, I, I, I don't even know how you can figure this out, but I just get so much pleasure from like networking with people and like helping them or gifting them and like, you know, just building those deep connections to somehow something that just rewards me so much. So I think that this is the right way. And I'm actually like surprised how you can even figure this out just based on the question, but I think you're spot on. And then my last question, if, if you still have a time for this, unless somebody else's question was just like, you know, like we're building that community and uh, we're at like this call start. We obviously have the network effect as well. So if there's not many users using it, it doesn't really, you know, make people want to use it. Um, the challenge is that, you know, like, even though like we're having new people joining every day, we're, we're not making them active, that they are just not using it much. So I'm just thinking if you're having any thoughts on, on, you know, like activating users, I, I think this is particularly relevant question to you guys, yes. because you on like a kind of, it's similar in a way. I mean, we're not doing the same thing, but we're trying to build a community, which is also for entrepreneurs and digital B2B space. So how many conversations are you having with your existing users every day? So what we're trying to do is as soon as the users join, then we're um, reaching out to them and then um, they're scheduling a call with them or what, with one of my co-founders. So like we end up like having maybe like two a week because not, not everyone's like responsive or wants to get on a call, even though we're offering them just, you know, like get to know each other. That's not the sale. That's, you know, just kind of, you know, trying to help them or network that with somebody else. So probably we're not doing a great job on that. That's probably an improvement. It's just like two a week right now. Right. I mean, I would be looking for other ways to connect with them, right? Maybe um, through the product isn't good enough. Like you need to maybe direct email them. Just call them if you have them, if you have that information in your database, right? Whatever right. it is, you need to talk to the people that are the ones who are staying and find out why they're staying. You know, a handful of users can give you 
tons of resources and also try to connect with the people who left and find out why they leave. By right? starting a community is difficult because you have that cold start where you know there's not a lot of conversation, a lot of content happening, the users aren't there. So I would recommend like, and you're probably doing this, but like you just have to be your own community, a community of one, and drive the conversations, drive the content, uh, you know, anything you can do to make it seem like your community has engagement will help uh, with that cool start. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. I just want other people to like let them ask questions. If there's no other questions from others, I'll, I will drop more, but I don't want to. Like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push more on the Q&A here. So yeah, um, so we, we have a question from an anonymous attendee, so I can't, um, I can't let them talk. Um, so I'll just read out for them. So they're asking any tool or platform recommendations for monitoring customer experience journey for apps. I believe you mentioned Heap, Is, are there any others? Yeah, there's a bunch of others. I mean, Heap is great for your budget. Um, it's great for web and for mobile. Obviously, there's stuff like CleverTap, uh, which is also relatively cheap for uh, app engagements. Um, so, okay, for product. Um, Raise, Apps Flyer, those can get really, really expensive. So, uh, but also like check out Product Hunt. You know, sometimes people drop like brand new products that um, revolve around this engagement and you can get something really cheap or an early offer on something, but um, I'm a big fan of Heap. I'm not sure if you have anything else to add to that. No, I think those are all good examples. You just gotta find what you're most comfortable with, whether it's Heap or, or Mixpanel or something else. Uh, but I think like you mentioned, Jason, like finding products that are inexpensive in the beginning, and that's, that's key. Yeah. Also, I like to use Captera a lot, um, where you can basically um, they they sort of do a competitive analysis on comparing different products. So that's a tool I use quite frequently. Yeah, that's great. Did we have more questions, uh, Jake? Um, we don't have any on deck. So I guess if Matt, you want to ask one more. Uh, yeah, I would love to. Thanks. Um, now I'm just thinking about like monetization strategies. So uh, we're offering everything for free. So we just want to build a community. We're thinking whether we should do it freemium. So like we have community, we have video courses, we have live calls with instructors and all that. We you know we teach all sorts of funnels like LinkedIn lead generation, call email and whatnot. And so like I'm thinking like whether we should like gate the access uh, so that you have to pay just for joining or whether we should make it free and there should be upgrades or um, I'm just I'm just thinking because I, I have no idea how to wrap wrap my mind around you know what should be free what should be paid what should be premium and I don't even know like what kind of framework should I kind of you know think of in my mind in that context so we're thinking just to, just just to give you a background so what we were thinking just make levels so we did like level zero where it's free like a $50 a month level, $300 a month level, and then $12.50 a month where you get also like one-on-one -on -one consulting with experts, you get accountability, you get like a project management officer and all that. So, you know, it goes like all the way from zero to, to, to premium. Uh, but yeah, I'm just curious how you guys are thinking about these kinds of things in terms of, you know, what's free, what do you monetize and that kind of business? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really great question and a difficult one to answer without having sort of more information. But I mean, obviously, and I've learned this lesson the hard way too, is there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So not only for like to validate yourself for the work that you're doing, you got to you got to turn on the, the faucet at some point and get these people to pay. And I would start with a much lower pricing point to begin with. You could always explore price later, but um, I mean, freemium is cool, but then I'd keep it very light to the freemium. Maybe it's just, you can uh, you know, engage in the community once a month or something, right? Uh, you got to get people paying because unfortunately, I think right now uh, with the economy the way it is, and you're trying to, if you're trying to raise capital, if that's an objective, you're not gonna build a sustainable business. Uh, you have to have paying customers. Or you don't really have a business. Yeah, no, I 100% I, uh, agree. Uh, I think that's a, it's a good way to wrap things up as well. You know, when you're going from zero to one, right? You gotta get paid. You gotta get paid. 
Uh, and the sooner you get paid, the better. Right. Exactly. And the more you get paid, the better. The more you get paid, the better, too. <laughs> if you can fund your own business with the revenue instead of raising a bunch of money, uh, that's certainly a lot less dilutive. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's really how you know if someone wants to use your 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 product and if you have product market fit eventually, right? That are people actually paying for this. Yeah, that's sort of the end of the mom test, right? Yeah. First, it's like, hey, mom, you know, did you like this recipe? Blip? But then it's really, at the end of the day, if you can get your mom to actually pay you for it, then you know. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, at Sunstone, and, and, and Jake for helping to moderate. Uh, I think this is a good way to, to wrap it up uh, today. And if you uh, want to learn more about MentorCam, you can visit us at mentor.cam. We'll also send out a brief survey after this uh, session. So if you could be, be so kind to uh, answer that survey, it's not going to take you more. It's going to take you maximum two minutes. Uh, we'd really, really appreciate it. So And follow us on LinkedIn and socials for more content like this. We'll be putting out. Exactly. That too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.